Right, we're heading out for the day. We're going to Duxford, the Imperial War Museum. Game, we booked tickets, haven't we? Yeah, time, time tickets. And ten o'clock, isn't it? Ten o'clock, yeah. Yeah, we can't take dogs round the museum. So uh, Poppy's going to have to stay in the van. We were a bit worried, to be honest, with it being so hot yesterday. That uh, it might get a bit warm in the van, but it's a lot cooler today. Yeah. You see, it's quite misty. The temperature, I think, at the moment is 18, 17, 18. It's much cooler, so isn't it's much, it? Much, much cooler. So we're a bit happier about leaving her in the in the van. She'd be in a crate. We'll be leaving the roof lights open, so there'll be plenty of ventilation. And we're going to try and find a shady spot, and we'll be checking on her um, at once an hour time, during, yeah. during the time we're there. Yeah. Probably won't be staying much past uh, midday anyway. No, no. But I mean, if it did get hotter, I'd come back. I'd stay with her so I can have more things open and see she's all right. Yeah. So I thought we'd tell you that just in case you're a bit worried about Poppy when we're not when she sees she's not with us. Yeah. Because I don't normally like going. Three quarters of a mile. Turn left onto B1040. Okay. We don't normally like going places we can't take her, do we? No, no. We haven't been to Duxworth for a very long time. You used to be able to go there from our house. Yeah. About 40 minutes from where we lived. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, that was over five years ago now. Yep, it was. Six years ago. Levi's, isn't there down there? Um, and the 505. 505. Well, there's the big hangar. That's where we parked before, wasn't it? Yeah, just in the uh, shade of it. And it says coaches only. Yeah. Let's see. There we are, there's a seaplane there. Catalina. Arriving at Imperial War Museum, Duxford. Right. A bit of a choice. See what it's like around the back. A lot of it seems to be coaches. Not that there's probably going to be many coaches. No. Go in there. Or in here somewhere. Yeah, this is coaches only. Yeah, I do, Standard parking, yeah. yeah. Shaded parking. Shaded parking, great. Ideal. Yeah, for vehicles with dogs. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, the thought of everything. <laughs> we did do this before, didn't we, many yeah. years ago? Yeah. Well, that's very thoughtful of the museum there, isn't it? Yeah. Here we are. Rather wet and soggy and be masked. <laughs> sort of takes your breath away when you come in here, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, the Harrier jump jet up there. Oh, look. I had a model of one of these. They are, yeah, Sunderland flying boat. Yeah, that's yeah, super. 
<laughs> yeah, fairy swordfish, I think. A little bit small. Yeah, but look at this. Oh, fantastic, they are. That's a fairy swordfish there. Is it? Yeah. Nice. No, no, the one above. Oh, is the a tiger above. moth. That's oh. tiger moth up there, and there's fairy swordfish here. Oh. Famous for the attack on the fleet at Taranto and it was equipped with radar and used to defend convoys of ships against U-boats and it was mainly uh, operated from carrier aircraft carriers carried torpedoes or mines to attack ships and bombs and land targets and a sturdy construction to withstand deck landings uh, it started in 1936 later in the war swordfish were main, mainly used to attack U-boats and defend British merchant convoys and finally replaced in service in May 1945. So they saw the whole war out, these planes. Yeah. Basically a relic from the First World War. But they are. <laughs> yeah, I know, and that's what I was... <laughs> yeah, you can't get too close to them. But, oh yeah. Super plane. Just, um, yeah, uh, Lancaster. There's a balcony above, isn't there? You can go up there. Right. Look down, down. Yeah, so they've got the, the ordnance there. And the Avro Lancaster Mark 10. Lancaster dropped a greater weight of bombs than any other aircraft in the strategic bombing campaign against Germany. And most famous for the Dam Busters raid. Famous bouncing bomb, which we saw at the Lincoln Aviation Heritage Museum. And right above us, probably really, one of the most famous shapes. Concord. Okay. Okay. Can't, you're supposed to be able to get time tickets to go on here. Yeah. <laughs> like the model. So this plane here, I remember from my childhood, this is the TSR-1 and there was a big um, spending overrun on this and um, the Labour government at the time cancelled it didn't they? No, uh, um, do you not remember Tony no. Ben? Tony oh TSR2, beg your pardon, TSR2. So it was using the, the same engines as Concorde oh, yeah, you're right. and it was cancelled in 1965 because of rising costs. It would have been some incredible aircraft. I mean look how short the wings are. Yeah stands for Tactical Strike Reconnaissance Mach 2 so it's capable of twice the speed of sound it was to be fitted with extremely advanced systems such as a digital computer and a heads-up display wow. which well, well yeah but I in mean those in those days, days yeah, that was yeah. something else yeah. this was space-age stuff <laughs> looking down the nose. The, the nose of it see how narrow it is yeah. it's basically a rocket ship huh. and standing underneath here you know what this is? how are you? what? I'm guessing <laughs> you're guessing it's a Vulcan, Vulcan yeah. yeah and if you thought the Lancaster's bomb bay was big yeah, so look at the Bombay on this. This was designed to carry nuclear weapons and missiles. That is. A terrifying weapon, really. Wasn't this what you went on at the Solway? Yeah, Museum? we went on one at Solway Museum. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's when you look under the bomb bay and see what was in here. It was basically a couple of engines and, and a huge bomb capacity. There, yeah, it's one of the missiles. A standoff nuclear missiles. Yeah. This is XJ824. It's a training plane, yeah. yeah, and Orford, yeah. and Oxford, big Oxford. pardon, Oxford. They had guns on the back of it. Yeah, training navigators and bombing. Yeah. Another little trainer, I think, isn't it? Magister, that is. Elementary training plane, the first mono monoplane training aircraft in service. Well, you're a bit exposed up there, weren't you? Mm. Yeah. Wind in your hair. People always sat in the front. Yeah. And the train on the back. <laughs> I've just seen the missile. It's got a few little ones. Yeah, yeah, a couple of little bombs, yeah. Head reef. They are so some of the ordnance. Ordnance. Good grief. Huge. It says many military aircraft carry weapons to attack tar targets to the ground or sea, air, they're called air to surface. It's all about air to surface weapons here. And the, yeah, that's right, the, the, the big weapon at the back was called uh, the um, Avro Blue Steel Missile. That was the, carried by the V bombers, the Vulcan the Victor and the Valiant and it was a used to deliver nuclear missiles from a standoff position outside radar range yeah so this is a cockpit of the tornado not much room in there was there So the Tornado is a multi-role aircraft, so fighter, reconnaissance, and bomber. It's a, made by an Italian, German, British consortium called Panavia. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't read that on the sign at all. No, you didn't? No. Yeah, that's the Jaguar up there. I think you need to get up on the balcony to see some of these, don't you? And over there is the Harrier. That was the first aircraft to be built by Britain and France jointly. It's a little bit older, isn't it, the one there? Yeah, so above us, as it says, is the Harrier, the GR3, fighter bomber, ground attack aircraft, commonly referred to as a strike aircraft. And it can hover, because of its Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine, with uh, movable thrust nozzles. And that, that was in the Falklands, that one. And that's, and that's the engine. So this is the Airco de Havilland DH-9, which is one of the first British bombers designed for strategic attacks on German cities, railways and airfields. And it wasn't very successful because of its underpowered and unreliable engine. It's one of 
first aircraft stationed here though. Yeah, stationed at Duxford. And it was built by Waring and Gillow of Hammersmith in London. It was intended as a training uh, machine that ended up in storage. It's never used. And in the early 30s it was one of the first, one of three DH9s transferred to the Imperial gift scheme. Whatever that is. Yeah. Huh. So what we've got over here then? So this is a Hastings. So it was an RAF long range transport aircraft. Which entered service in 1948 and took part in the Berlin airlift. So this is a very familiar looking aircraft. This is a Lysander, isn't it? I think mainly used as reconnaissance, but this is in here for restoration. Yeah. And that would have been very familiar to your dad at the back, oh, wouldn't yeah, it? The Blenheim, the Blenheim yeah. yeah. Not a very attractive looking aircraft, was no, it? It's really fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this is the Spitfire Mark I. And this was iconic because it entered service in 1938 at Duxford. The restored Spitfire was flown by Geoff Geoffrey Stevenson, commander of 19 Squadron, when he was shot down over Dunkirk on 26th of May 1940. It crash landed on a beach in Calais. replica navigator and wireless operators section for the Lancaster there. I don't know if you can see much of that. It seems all the, so that's where your dad would have worked, isn't it? Yeah, that's where he was at. Yeah. Oops, closer to that. Yeah, I saw one of those the other day, didn't I? Yeah, that's yeah. right, I saw one at Lincoln, anyway. Yeah. yeah. A pair of headphones. Yeah. That was your dad's workstation. Yeah. Great. Right. Somewhere in the middle of one of these. Yeah, and someone here was saying that yeah. uh, they found all the heating, when they had the heating on it, yeah. it was warm enough for the pilot, yeah. co pilot, it yeah. got too hot, and anyone else further down the plane got colder and colder. <laughs> A bit like our previous motor. Yeah. There's a better picture there, isn't it? Yeah, and it tells you what the navigator was responsible for. Making sure the aircraft found its way to target and back home, so. Yeah. And that the navigator wasn't doing anything. It obviously find its way to targets using calculations based on several factors, including speed, timing of flight, wind speed and direction, compass bearings, and readouts from navigational aids such as G and H2S. The flares dropped by the Pathfinder force then directed the bomber to its target. So it didn't have radar, uh, radar or GPS no, or no. sat nav. No. And then when he did his wireless operator bit. Yeah. And the wireless operator was responsible for communication within the aircraft and all communication between the aircraft and ground. Use their sets to monitor direction finding signals and help the bombers find their way home. In addition, they acted as ears of the bombers using their fish pond radar warning system. They could tell the crew when a German night fighter had locked onto them and from which direction it was likely to attack. Navigator's position there yeah, with the yeah, map. That's, and that's right. the wireless that's operator. You, but your dad was a. He was a, both. He yeah. was both, yeah. yeah. Trained as both. Oh, so that's 
see it all together like that. Yeah, yeah. Right, going up onto Concord. God, size of that engine. That is enormous. And it seems such a big aircraft on the outside and quite low on the inside. Yeah, this was a test rig, wasn't it? I seem to remember they used this as a test one. Ooh, wiring in the back. Yeah, control and test wiring. So 200 miles of wiring in Concorde 101. Flight data recorder. Intake computers. I don't touch anything it says. No. The wiring in there, look. Mm. Emergency power unit. That's a to provide electrical power in case of engine failure. I'd be a bit worried if the engine failed. Zonal units there. Sorry? Zonal units or something. Yeah, I don't know what that is. But it's not. I think the roof is not particularly tall, I'm just under six foot, so head's almost brushing the ceiling. So this was for the flight crew, development engineers and the occasional VIPs travel with the aircraft and test flights. Seats were rather less luxurious than those on commercial Concorde planes. Yes, they're just sort of basic, basic seats. Drama, yeah. yeah. There's a nitrogen jack back up for the hydraulic system. All the things about the use to measure build up of ice and de icing systems. <laughs> Computer here, look. Oh, a Schlumberger with the old tape, yeah? Yeah. Oh, remember that? I started at the bank. Yeah. You can get a virtual tour. You can download the app. Only 99p. And I'll tell you all about it. Probably better than I can. So here's the middle doors. It's quite long, isn't it? It is. It feels fairly roomy with no seats in. I suppose with all the seats in here, it would have been a bit, a bit cramped. Mm. I imagine that's uh, access to the uh, undercarriage, or mm. well, underneath. I don't know. Escape hatch. There you go. Escape hatch. Escape hatch. Oh. Last resort of abandoning the aircraft in flight. Go down there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some oxygen cylinders. That was for the test crew. Presumably, you wouldn't see this on a normal Concorde flight. This is a test flight test observer station used to record various aspects of the flights and the aircraft's performance. Well, the adding machine. You had a, one of those adding machines there. Breathe. <laughs> Sort of monitoring the engine. And it's an abandoned aircraft beacon there. Not that we were planning for the worst. Escape <laughs> <laughs> action. Yeah, overwhelming. Yeah, 
the sound level on the flight deck has decreased quite a lot. That uh, airflow noise we were getting before has now diminished. Once the engines have all stabilised, Bill Brown will select the reheats in pairs. First of all, the inboards. There they are, just cutting in. We're going to take a timing on that. And the outboards, please, Bill. Hmm. And we'll see that doing a little blip up and down the scale of these. Look down, down the, the end there. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. Enjoyed that. And you get a nice view. Moses Lake. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant aircraft. These time tickets though make it more enjoyable. Well, they do they? because you're on, sure your you're on your own. own. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure we've been on this before. And yeah. Sort of, you know, try and get out of people's way. And yeah. All right, we're up on the balcony. Right. So we're standing there. What's that? 18. That's the Royal Aircraft Factory RE8. Okay. So what else can you see? Obviously, you can see the Harrier. Yeah, that's 24. Where's 24? Big in the middle. In the middle. At that's the thing. far back. That's an Avro Canada Canuck 4B. Yeah. It's a little bit far away from us here, isn't it? Yeah. Let's have a little wander around further. Because so it gives you a chance to see the planes on the upper levels, isn't it? Yeah. Tiger Moth there. Yeah, West, Westland Lysander Mark 3A. <laughs> so, mosquito over there. So that's a Westland whirlwind. Royal well, Navy, presumably a rescue helicopter. There is so much to see here, isn't there? And this is just the one building, isn't it? 